Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we're t talking to you about what's the point of reading or studying literature. Uh, my name's uh, Ben Grant. I'm a lecturer in English literature here in the Department for Continuing Education, and this is Tara Stubbs, who also works Hello. in the department. And yeah, I mean, if, I don't know how many of you have done English literature modules here before any kind of courses. A few of you, but most of you not. So yeah, so we have a lot of different day schools and weekly classes on offer in English literature. And we also do a foundation certificate in English literature, which is like the equivalent of the first year of a degree. So yeah, do, do have a look at our programmes and uh, see what you'd like to do. I mean, so, so yeah, to get you thinking really about whether you might be interested in studying literature, what it means to study literature, we, we th thought we'd ask you this question. We, as I say, we're making it quite an interactive uh, session, so getting you to think about um, this question, what's the point of reading slash studying literature um, in brackets there? I mean, what do, you have, do, you, do you think there is a difference between reading and studying literature? Yes. Yeah, what's the difference? Um, well, reading is, you're, you're in the role of the consumer, mm. and you're reading for pleasure or for information or whatever. Studying is deconstructing and trying to get behind and underneath and understand the meaning of and the structure of and why things are done and how things are done and the Analyzing things. Yeah, so there's a difference there between sort of pleasure and thinking, I guess you're suggesting, it's sort of analysing. So, so yeah, so we ask these these questions really to sort of get start you getting to think about this. So some options here. Why did you come to this talk we'd <laughs> like to know? Uh, is it because you're interested in reading literature? Because you're interested in studying literature? You don't understand the need to study literature, or will you enjoy reading it? Or none of the above? So mm -hmm. let's have a show of hands then. So who's interested? You can choose more than one, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and we're not making notes, are we? <laughs> so who's interested in reading literature? Good. Yeah, so most of you are interested in reading literature, which I guess we don't, not we don't expect. Is, not everyone. <laughs> <laughs> so how many of you are interested in studying literature then? Okay, so that's most of you as well. So what do you, mean, what do you understand then by studying? Any other thoughts about that? What, when you put your hands up there, what did you mean by, by studying? Yeah. Um, well, if I read literature, it's my interpretation of the text. Mm. Whereas if I'm studying literature, I'm looking at, we're all different, we all see different things in yeah. the text. So studying it would be actually looking in more detail at what the, the author is trying to say. Mm. Yeah, you suggest this, your interpretation, whereas that you, I think it was a suggestion as well, that studying is looking at other people's interpretations yes, as well. Yes, that's, that's from important. different viewpoints, really. Yeah. But actually having that in mind, but also very much what the author was intending to look at that. Really. Yeah, does everyone agree with that, that idea of the author, that's about what the author thinks? Mm. No. <laughs> yeah, the back. Yeah, it's one part. Yeah. Not all of it, obviously. That's at the back. I also like to try to understand how the author reflects their culture, their background, their particular perspective. Mm. Yeah. Whether it was radical compared with other authors of that time or not. Yeah, so the wider context, wider literary context, wider historical context, and so on, another thing that you might be studying. So there's all kinds of things that you might be be looking at when you're studying literature. So how about this one? Don't understand the need to study literature, although enjoy reading it. Anyone fall with that? Category? Yes. Or this is what, this is the kind of people we wanted to come actually. <laughs> <laughs> Great. And so, there's yeah. someone else over here as well. Great. Yeah. Okay. So do you want to start? What? Why? Why have you chosen that one? Um, what it says on the tin. Um, do you think it kind of destroys a text just to study it? Because some people do think like that. Um, well, it was certainly the rule of thumb amongst my fellow undergraduates that taking an English literature degree spoiled English literature for the rest mm. of their life. <laughs> you didn't do that. Did you do an English oh, literature I'm degree? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the lady yesterday yeah. said similarly was also a scientist. That's mm. really interesting because you did this session yesterday. So. Yeah, so is there anyone who studied, <laughs> who studied English literature who has found that it's ruined their experience of literature? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And why is that takes the pleasure out of reading? You can't just divorce yourself from it? Or, or, or why is it? I, I only studied English literature to O-level. Mm. And um, 
it was incredibly prescriptive mm -hmm. um, and very dry mm -hmm. and um, it was very much this is what this means right. yeah. Um, yeah. Like there wasn't there wasn't room for discussion or interpretation. You're, you're mm -hmm. nodding over there as well, you agree, yeah. yeah. So Robert, you, you said the same um, thing. Well, I actually did English, American and French studies. Oh, <laughs> so wow. So I read a lot of literature um, because I love it so much. I enjoyed my degree incredibly. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, no, so you did. So yeah, you didn't find that. Experience. Yeah, and I think is, I mean, one of the reasons why we've done this actually is because it's it's very much in the news recently that people have been put off doing English, and particularly at A level, I mean, because they found that experience of doing of GCSE or O level to be a very stultifying experience. I, I think there is a difference between studying, isn't there, at, at GCSE and, and later on? You've had your hand up, or did you? But I don't agree, but some people say that there is no need to study English literature or literature mm. in general just because of the cost-benefit analysis. Mm. Yeah. So what yeah. is actually a benefit of studying literature? Mm. I mean, does it heal a cancer patient or, I don't know, um, get us to the moon? Yeah. <laughs> That's the argument other people might say. Yeah, so absolutely. So the student fees as well comes into how we talk about cost-benefit yeah. if people are paying for it. Yeah. yeah, so there's this, this big emphasis, at particularly at the moment at graduate level as well, which is something that will... Um, some of the writers we're looking at today are trying to defend. So even beyond your undergraduate, what's the <coughs> point of doing a PhD, say, in English literature? This is the big argument at the moment, because this idea of learning for learning's sake is becoming increasingly inf unfashionable. It makes me sad in a way, because learning, I think, has its own value. But obviously, we're, enter you know, we're in a period of economic... Uh, decline. So, what is the value? I mean, literally, the value as well—the economic value of doing things like this. Mm. You know, it's important to think about. Um, yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, that is something we're going to be going on to talk about. No, yeah. I was just going to say, I think for me, the point of the art of humanity is about life. It's about yeah. understanding mm. life, and passion. Uh, and yeah. You know, yeah. There's, there's a quote. There's, yeah, there's a quote that speaks very, very well for that. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, so, something something came up yesterday from that cancer patient. Somebody said, "Well." Well, it might have been me. I might be quoting myself. <laughs> that you might. The reason you might want to live is because of the humanities. Mm. You know, so science might save your life, you but the humanities might it. enrich it. Yes, yeah, yeah. through the literature, sort <laughs> yeah. of yeah. 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 some sort of empathy through text. Yes, that's yeah. an, yes, that's another yeah. well put, put point as well. A lot of it's about communication, mm. culture, all those kinds yeah. of things. Mm. Well, he quoted Robin Williams in the Dead Poet Society. He basically said that science, is, science lawyers. Um, are necessary to sustain life, whereas literature is necessary to make you passionate about life. Exactly, yeah. But yeah. It, except for the fact that isn't it the case that the majority of scientific advancement over the last 50 mm. years has come from Star Trek, which is... Oh, is that true? That's an interesting term. Debatable point. So anyone have none of the above? Yeah. Any none of the above? Yeah, none of the above. Oh. At ten years, and I did, did always find myself trying to try have recourse to different arguments. Some like some that have been quoted here, but mm. different defense, defenses of it, and yeah. some like well being speech trainer. So yeah. I'm interested to know. Yeah. Oh great, I'm find out a better. Answer. <laughs> 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 so it would be, yeah, good point. To <laughs> what to what to tell people? Yeah, we should be great. making notes. Great. So um, we've got six quotations that we've selected and what we'd like to do is um, for everybody to get into one of six groups I mean I can kind of arbitrarily make them probably three this side three that side makes sense doesn't it mm -hmm. um, I'm going to spend five minutes talking um, the, the quotation that you'll discuss is the one that's in bold on your sheet and then we'll come back and we'll talk about them I haven't written the authors yet because we want <laughs> that to be part of the discussion and then we'll talk about it after the group here isn't there so. mm -hmm.
Roomy, this room, isn't it? What's that? A bit larger, this room. Yeah. <laughs> I thought in my head that it should probably start about 20 minutes. Mm. Five minutes per hour, and that's half an hour. Mm. So that's about 20 And then it could finish by five to three. It's already really crowded. Mm. I don't know why, but it really bothers me when I can't tie something up. Oh, yeah. Because you know that if they were to do that, they should be if they didn't. Yeah. Yeah. I, don't, I, I never, I never <laughs> have time. I always run out of time. Yeah, I quite like it. I think my problem is I talk too fast. So it's really early. Uh, I think one time as well, I got asked to help you with the paper and the issues of science. We got the maths wrong on the word, so I was to 150 words. I went through one more and I'd done it for 30 minutes when it was supposed to be 50 minutes. Um, I suddenly realised about 20 minutes in because I was speaking really slow. It got to 35. Yeah. And now a QA. Like, oh, say whatever you want to know about Fitzgerald. Yeah. <laughs> That's about the same timing as me. I always reckon like 20 minutes, 3,000 words. Yeah. So it's about, it's about right. That's pretty so, quick. Yeah, one of my colleagues told me that, and I think it does work quite well. Mm. It is quite quick. Sandy speaks very slow. Yeah, I wish some I people do very slow. I can't do it. It makes me really self conscious. Mm. I don't know, I find it quite difficult to listen when people are speaking very slow. Waiting for the next word. Yeah. Repeat it. Yeah. Yeah. Is that the time? Yeah, it was two of them, so we did each other. I don't know if you know what was going on. I don't know if you know what was going on. I don't know if you know what was going on. I don't know if you know what was going on. I don't know if you should never rely. I don't know why they bother to yeah. do it for you anyway. It's just a question of sticking a memory stick. Yeah. I think it's quite funny. To me, I don't think they completely think the point of archaeology is really obvious. Yeah. It's like the dinosaurs. Yeah. <laughs> it's the point of archaeology. Didn't they just have that massive dinosaur discovery again? It's going to take 20 years. Well, that's not archaeology. That's very I know. That kind of thing. <laughs> All right, then, you're being studied. I say we discovering things related to the history is obviously really important. Mm. I'm not really sure why that would be a controversial. I'm not sure what you would talk about. Yeah. Yeah. Some people say history is unimportant. Yeah, do they? It well, <laughs> might just end up with a more supportive history. Mm. Perhaps. Someone else was doing an introduction to it. Maybe that was that one. Yeah, I know, he looked like it. <laughs> 
It's when you get someone in with their note team. Oh, yes, so I'm the the note the team. Team. Yeah. <laughs> That wasn't me. <laughs> yeah, that would be good. Yeah, we yeah. better start. Should we um, all come? Is your boy singing out? Should we all come back to the, uh, the middle? I've just realised that we've both got quite quiet voices. So yeah. maybe okay, let's <laughs> let's start doing some feedback then. <laughs> together we can be loud. Can't yeah. Should we just go one to six then? That makes sense. So you, you, you're the. Uh, yeah, so we're just going to go through the quotes then and we'll bring them up on the board and we can have a, a discussion of them. <clears throat> so, this one Studying literature rather than making us happy can help us to understand better what happiness is, how we may better put ourselves into the way of it, and how education may improve the kind and quality of some of our pleasures. And this is from Helen Small, who is one of our colleagues actually down the road in Pembroke, and it's called The Value of the Humanities. Does it surprise you that it's quite a recent book? Because yesterday people said, oh, it sounds a bit 19th century. That's what people were saying. <laughs> um, we, we chose it really, didn't we? Because we were, we were talking quite a lot about happiness when we were talking about this session. And, we, and it's one of the few quotations we could find that tried to actually evaluate what happiness is. Mm. And what did you think as a group? I think I think we we I think we saw it as two different propositions. One was rather than making us happy can help us to understand better what happiness is, and that being a separate proposition to mm. um, education may improve the kind of quality of some of our pleasures. Yes. Mm. Um, and I think we agree and disagree on everything. I think we, um, we we thought that um, uh, in terms of the f that first proposition that um, uh, uh, and one of the things that we talked about was that, that, that there's a lot of tragedy in, yes. uh, in literature. So people so brought that up yesterday as well. So um, yeah. does really studying tra tragedy <laughs> make you understand what happens? Yes. Um, it only, perhaps in contrast with. <laughs> well, that's yeah. now really bright. Oh, that's okay. Thank you. Then. Um, so that that was one of the things, and then then the other thing was in, in terms of um, education may improve the kind of quality of some of our pleasures. We thought that's a bit of a, a dub I think the summary would be it's a bit of a double-edged sword, mm. because um, education may improve may may help you to appreciate things on more levels, link one thing with another, etc., etc. Um, but also ignorance may be bliss mm. ignorance. yeah actually yeah we talked about that when we were planning this session because i told uh, ben about a student i had who that's what happened to her we, we were doing beckett we were talking about nihilism and it actually got her really really down because she'd mm. never thought about nihilism before mm. or is this idea that you know there's no point in going on 
And actually, she was like, I wish I hadn't started studying this now if I knew that English was about nihilism as much as it is about, you know, the sublime. And it's that kind of thing, yeah, sometimes it's uncomfortable, isn't it? Sometimes it's what you don't critical want to know. Voice. There's a critical yeah. voice that comes in when you study. But first of all, I think you also said that by just but that sort of educate, that emotional education, by the, all the examples that you yes. read of in literature, it's helps you articulate an understanding of happiness, perhaps. Yes. Just by the... Uh, the empathic yeah. sort of yes definitely yeah. so it's something to do with empathy I think like you mentioned earlier I think is important mm. yeah I think it's how we may better put ourselves into the way of it did you discuss that at all what that, what that meant it's kind of <laughs> putting yourself in the way of happiness I don't think we really did did we um, no <laughs> sort of too busy discussing the other two bits mm. I guess in simplistic terms it might just be like well that book made me feel yeah. this way and yeah. I, that's an addictive yeah. feeling and maybe I'll read that type of book again well that person was you know, happy when they drugs. went to see that cathedral so maybe yeah. I'll go <laughs> yeah so there's a kind of maybe it's about serotonin as much as anything else that kind of mm. lift you get when you read or engage with something that you enjoy um, did anyone else have a chance to look at that one and think anything about it. I just wanted to disagree with tragedy and oh happiness yeah. because I think tragedy, at least the way it was written in classical Greek times, was more like you you basically start with the protagonist, you basically have some sort of catharsis, and I think mm. that might also make you yeah. happier understanding basically the emotions yes. change. But so I think yeah, I think that's part of Small's point that it's actually. Um, Happiness comes from kind of empathy, from understanding and from knowing, going on a journey with people. So it might not be a kind of happiness as in elation, but as in a feeling of community or communion or those kinds of things. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, the next one is on. So this is from Small again, actually. Um, what she's doing is really glossing Matthew Arnold, who's a 19th century cultural uh, theorist and and lecturer and teacher and poet who spent a lot of time in Oxford. Um, and as Ben mentioned yesterday, he also went into schools and tried to um, uh, give schools advice on what to teach and how to teach. So she says, the study of the humanities ostensibly best represented by literature should deliver something more than the scientific pursuit of knowledge can ever give us, something that matters for life. A bit like somebody said over there earlier, actually. And um, what did you think in your second group? <laughs> we have mixed views, really. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, uh, some of us thought really the purpose is to give entertainment, give pleasure, give enjoyment, it's something that um, uh, is to just stimulate you. Mm -hmm. um, and some of us others thought that maybe, yes, uh, it needs to challenge and give us a deeper insight. Um, it was more than just knowledge, more than understanding. Mm. Um, I'm not sure we answered the question. Well, we yes. didn't hear really, no, really, no. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because there's, there's always this idea in the, I think particularly in literary studies, I can't really speak for, say, history, because I don't know it as well, but that knowledge is less important somehow, that you can get a fact wrong, and that doesn't really matter. But, but if you kind of misread or you, you know, you kind of misunderstand, that is more important than, you know, getting a date wrong or something like that. And I guess she's getting at that with this idea of of life being slightly more important than knowledge. And, and it's things like understanding and learning and all those kinds of words that perhaps are more difficult to define. But I think something that's slightly problematic here is this idea, because I'm looking at the scientist over there, that, that's o that science only gives you knowledge. Mm -hmm. I think that's a bit unfair to science, actually. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, science is surely about life as much as anything um, else is. You know, the vast majority of the human race managed quite happily without literature, yeah. throughout history. <laughs> uh, so, literature is like the icing on the top. So what do, you, do you mean as in um, you mean as in the novel, or because I mean poetry is as old as I mean it's always been as old as language, isn't it? The okay. Page, page painting. I mean, it, it depends the what you paintings. mean by. I mean, if you think of stories, uh, it yes. would be difficult to think of how humans could survive without stories. I think storytelling is absolutely fundamental to the way that we live and the way that we think about our down, lives. People just told stories, oral tradition. I mean, st yeah, storytelling is as old yeah. as language. I guess are you talking about humans that? That did you know predating language? Or uh, there might have been use for stories, you know, for celebrating certain occasions. Oh. But um, 
you know, for a long time, most people were illiterate. But I don't think literature and literacy are necessarily the same things because you can have oral literature. Yeah. I mean, even though the word means something that is It read. does open up the question yeah. of what literature yeah. is, doesn't it? Sense, and what yeah. actually in its essence. I mean, if you think about storytelling in, in the broader sense, you know, you can't really live without telling a story about your life, about, about the world around you. Science itself is, is, contains lots of stories. So if mm. you read it in a more, more general sense, we talk start talking about formal literature, metrical poetry, or, um, you know, so it does open up that question of what we mean by literature, so what's the point of literature? Is there any form of um, society, you need some management, you need uh, politics and uh, some social management mm. of the society, mm. uh, and that can't rely on just knowledge from scientific no. pursuits, it needs understanding of how things are, how people are, people and how people it. respond yeah. and act in certain ways. Mm. Yeah. And um, uh, literature can help um, get up a level of understanding. And, and, I th yeah, um, and I think that's what Arnold was saying when he talked a lot about culture. Culture being very important because it's the way that people create societies and ideas of societies and also societal difference as well is understood, is understood through an understanding of culture. You know, so that means it might be tradition, it might be religion, it might be all sorts of things. And also literature has been around quite uh, long, long before uh, basically our time to answer question, basic humanity, human questions, because the Gilgamesh epos is actually about finding immortality. Delia and tries to find immortality. So um, really early, even before, um, when was Gilgamesh? Will that be C? Yeah. Yeah, sure. More than that, I think. More yeah. than that, um, yeah. but he was really far trying to find the answer to where we're we going, mm. immortality. Mm. So. Yeah. I don't I but no, it's an interesting question about when literature becomes mm. literature yeah, because exactly. it literally means something that is read. Yeah, so I mean, I the mean what, you know, well, the concept that we now have of literature actually, you know, if, if you look at uh, Dr. Johnson's 18th century dictionary, he just des describes it as letters. I mean, this is mm. a very short definition of literature. Mm. I mean, since then, the whole kind mm. of idea of what we now think of as literature has, has evolved and, and kind of been mm. consolidated. You look at the next Great, uh, yes. quote. This was Ben's choice. So oh, yes. <laughs> See, Oscar Wilde, then, all art is quite useless. Um, so, yeah, I mean, Oscar Wilde is very much associated with the movement of decadence, and you can see there, you know, a decadent um, artist. And so, this, this was an iconic, really, uh, quote of his, one of his epigrams. So, what did you think of that? Did you agree that all art is quite useless? Yeah. So it's a different kind of use. Yeah. Whether animals produce art or not. Mm. Then that makes mm -hmm. Yeah. Art really play. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Good, good question. And yeah. It's it also fed the soul. Mm. Which is important. Yeah. And then we did also touch on artist propaganda. Um, mm. Yeah. A government of the day might think it was extremely useful mm. in that period. Yeah. China and Russia and people like that. Yeah. Um, Yes. <laughs> yeah, and the other side of that, of course, is you might think that literature is very useful for questioning and att attacking, you know, those exactly. kinds of orthodoxies and, and social um, structures. Um, so, yeah, that kind of political use um, of literature. And, and these are all very prevalent ideas, aren't they? That, you know, those kinds of uses that we might have um, for literature. So, I mean, did, did anyone in the group sort of agree with that and kind of see what wild... I mean, he wasn't joking here. This is quite serious about this idea that... All art is quite useless. No, I don't. I don't think he was. With Oscar Wilde, I think he would be almost promoting questioning. Yeah, no. I, I mean, there is an element of you know stating something as as extreme as, as possible, but there is. I mean, I think it's really going back to the Romantic period, the sort of late eighteenth century, this idea of art as being useless, as a a challenge to the idea that everything has to be useful, that actually. You know, art, there might be a, a place for something which doesn't have that. It's just not all about usefulness. Yeah. 
No, it's something to celebrate. Something. It's, it's a celebration. Yeah. yeah. That has got utility. Yeah. Exactly. So people dismiss art as being useless. So that's completely useless art. So it's like, well, actually, that's all valuable. That's what's important about it. Yeah. Mm. And yeah. to what we were just saying earlier about literature, how it's defined now, but previously there was always storytelling and, and the Aboriginal peoples and their storytelling. Mm. Um, and it's important for cultures and communities to, it's, it's not useless because it gives very often, it is given um, the history and the culture of the mm. people and enabled it to carry on and have continuity. Yeah. Yeah, so it's maybe, a, I mean, Wilde was very keen on paradoxes, wasn't it? That, that idea of uselessness, that that might, be, that might be bound up with all those different uses of it, it might have something to do with the fact that it is intrinsically useless, that you can do so much with it. Mm. Yeah. Just wanted to um, mm. help, because if you say if it's true art, it should serve no yeah. function. Yeah. Yeah. tend to be that it's about the reader and the interpretation and he hasn't put those in that would sometimes be it's harder to I think claim that with some of the plays but say something like Dorian Gray if you read that quite carefully a lot of what you think happens is just it's off centre or off stage and you're inferring that it's happening so I think his whole idea is that well, actually it's the reader that's putting their grubby mind in. It's the, <laughs> it's the reader who's engaging with these things. And all I've done is produce a beautiful piece of art. Mm. And, so, and I think Ben's point is really interesting about uselessness being actually something that therefore you can do lots of things with. If it's inherently useless, then you might put it to mm. a purpose. But that is up to you. To yeah, put it to that it's not what it's. It's not the, the what actually defines art. I guess is what yeah. he's saying. You can't. You can't say it's useful. And if it, it ceases to be art, if it's purely designed, like you're talking about propaganda, that debate yeah. about where does art end and propaganda begins. That's a very difficult question for writers who want to produce political art. You know, it's mm. like well, where the end does it just become propaganda? You know, you also want it to be art as well. So I think. It, Opens up. So yeah, art yeah. must have an element of the frivolous in order mm. to be art. Yeah, but things a lot, a lot of things that we would think about as art now specifically had sp specific purposes, yeah. whether mm. they were um, uh, royalty or or the church having portraits mm. painted mm. to show them yeah. in a specific light, mm -hmm. um, yeah. or to put across uh, a specific message, or having a chapel decorated this ceiling of the mm. chapel decorated to, um, for, for a religious purpose to to lift people up to yeah. show them uh, these incredible miracles or, or, or whatever mm. these are things that, that are defined as art but they, mm. they're also commissioned for very specific yeah. purposes so it, it, I think that's right really how to use. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's, as I say, it was only really in the Romantic period that this question of usefulness and uselessness started. Before then, it wasn't really questioned. Art was useful, you know, it did serve those kinds of purposes. And, the, you know, the Catholic Church used art very much to promote itself against Protestantism. Yeah. And so. if we, think, we think it contrasts really well with this next quotation, which mm. is from Tony Morrison, because I think one of the things that, that governs a lot of where Wilde is coming from is a kind of elitist idea as well. You know, something that we haven't really talked about yet, but it's kind of a the, the sort of white Western male elitist tradition. Wilde can say that art is useless because most art, let's face it, is in service to his type of person. Someone like Toni Morrison can't say the same thing about art that exists. So for her, I think there's a much more politicised... Um, she talks about necessity here. She sees literature as having um, a kind of a really important purpose. So I think it's it's a really good contrast actually with the wild. Mm. Yeah. So, yeah, so this new, almost completely digitalized and globalized world, where language is becoming increasingly bankrupt in the rush to one size fits all, literature it seems to me is needed now more than it has ever been. So yeah, those of you who are looking at that one, what did you find to say about it? Did you talk about this one? <laughs> and now I just say it was well, some of the bits that we talked about a lot and a lot of, uh, sort of how quickly um, the digital world has kind of uh, you know, made us react and think and do and so we become quite impatient. Um, maybe I'm just speaking for myself. 
myself. But, <laughs> um, but I think one of the things the last sentence that um, sort of saying literature is, is needed now more than ever suggests um, maybe a, a slowing down. Mm. And there's something about that yeah. slowing down and taking time to read full sentences as opposed to emojis and mm. things like that. And we also had a discussion around, you know, that it's not necessarily that um, you know the digital age is a bad thing, and all, but it's mm. about finding a balance. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I thought it was interesting that some of the language, bankrupt, bush, mm. quite sort of emotional, emotionally linked, really, to this sort of digitalized and globalized world, which isn't completely true. Mm. It doesn't exist everywhere in the world. So I thought it's quite. It's isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> a bit of a bash on the head. You know, it's time for you lot to sit up and, and take notice, really. Um, mm. But there is value in some of the ways in which we communicate in different ways rather than just literature. You know, I was saying, mm. I have a great nephew. I get lots of WhatsApp showing me his latest eating habits and various <laughs> other things. And that's a great way of me getting an insight into what's happening with him. Yeah. So I think we, we should em think about embracing a bit what some of these technologies are also providing. Yeah. That they should that they're all there and it's about how we how we balance them, how we make the best mm. use of them and ourselves as individuals. Yeah. We yeah, we talked a lot about balance at the end in terms of how you can have a world where you have to communicate effectively and quickly all the time and the mm. consequences that that has, but also that there isn't this move we feel like but maybe there's this thing in humans that makes you want to find a balance with that and that when you go to work and you have to answer a lot of emails all the time like mm. very quickly when you go home you take that time for yourself to kind of move a bit slower and yeah. read or like we talk about arts and crafts that's becoming a lot more popular now as well mm. you see the resurgence of people trying to find pockets of time that slow down yeah. and that kind of literature falls into that a bit as mm. well yeah, so that need for literature on a personal level. Are there any other needs that you were talking about that literature might have which, that, that you can't get from digital? Which you get? Do you think in terms of the news, like people reading it, mm. like you could classify some long form journalistic pieces as, as literature, whereas you, know, mm. you have that kind of a listicle mm. that is very good at getting information across quickly, but if you have something that's complicated, the issue that you have in distilling something that's complicated into yeah, yeah, and I think she's getting at that. There's something to do with the language, isn't there? She's talking about the one size fits all against something which is more complex and more allowing those nuances, different voices. Yeah. 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 Well, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, she was right there said 2000, and you see how things yeah, have moved on since then, yeah. and really what she's saying has very much come to be where you've got that. It, there's a millennial fear there, isn't there, how this stuff yeah. is going to take off. Mm. I remember feeling a bit like that. Yeah, yes, absolutely. So this idea of actually, you know, now that it's it's here, we can maybe see ways yeah. of seeing it more complicated than she's suggesting. Is uh, I think so I'm thinking back of it a little bit as well from a kind of more literary point of view is this question of who is an author as well and who gets to be an author. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what she's worried about too, the kind of authority that comes with writing. Is this going to be a world in which everybody assumes that they have a voice and something to say? And I think that's come true in a way, hasn't it? That lots of people are reading less, but somehow writing more in a funny way because they've become like little mini, even on Twitter or something, people are mini authors, but they mm. might not be that well read. They might not be taking yeah. the time to read around. And I think that's something that's at the back of what she's talking about as well. And what she means there by literature is I think she means kind of really thought through, you know, cleverly wrought literature, you know, time, something that somebody's met, take, taken yeah. time to make and rather than just thrown out, you know. And also perhaps yeah. from the reader's point of view, the literature means that you're reading, but what you're reading, you're being critical about. Yes. Which might kind of disappear in the quick yeah. snippet of what comes out on Twitter. You just take it as is. Yes. Like for a lot of, if you're looking at a little article somewhere, any newspaper online, people read the headline, 
and then you can already tell when they're sort of commenting that they never read the yes, article because the the what they're saying is probably nonsense, but they just read the headline, yeah. yeah. went with it, and started commenting. So, yeah. like, no, mm. read the so something important that she's saying about reading as well, that you know, to write is also to have readers and critical readers. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to say that this was, this is I think not a new development, I mean even earlier some people put their ideas into a book, for example Margaret Mitchell's Gone with the Wind, yeah. which is very much pro-slavery, and then you basically needed a rebuttal like Toni Morrison's mm -hmm. um, Beloved. Mm -hmm. So I think it is more like a communication, but um, nowadays everyone can communicate, yes. that is basically overflowed. But previously it was in hand of elite. Yeah. But is she is she talking about standards of English as well? I think she is. Yeah, she's mm. talking about standards of English. Yeah. Ben talks about one size fits all. There's yeah. a fear of language change and mm. language slippage, isn't there? Yeah. yeah. Um, we ran out of time on. yesterday, so we're really trying <laughs> not to today. <laughs> so we're going to go on the next one, if that's okay. <coughs> ben, this is your choice as oh, well. Yeah. Was that at the back that you had it? Percy Shelley's uh, Defence of Poetry, which is a really important document, actually, in the history of, sort of literary criticism. I mean, he, he, I was saying that, you know, the Romantic period, people were being attacked for, you know, art was a useless thing, and someone wrote something which was saying, you know, all poetry is pretty useless these days. It used to be important, but it isn't anymore. And Shelley kind of rebutted that in this piece of Defence of Poetry, which has lots of really important ideas and de defences, if you're looking for defences of poetry, uh, that's a good place to start. Yeah, and one of the things he says is, uh, poetry, by which, I mean, he does have a wi much wider definition of poetry, you know, he kind of includes Plato as a poet, for instance. Uh, poetry or literature, then, lifts a veil from the hidden beauty of the world and makes familiar objects be as if they were not familiar. Mm -hmm. So let's look at that one at the back, yeah, yeah. So what did you think of that? Yeah, we were, we were thinking it was quite interesting in the fact that, um, you know, it's taking somebody else's point of view and the way that they see the world and the way that they're able to express themselves can actually give you a different Mm. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so there's other points of view that allowing you to see different different ways of thinking of the world. Any, anything else you were talking about? Well, we meant well. I mentioned for the poetry or prose how in less <laughs> in less words, really, you'd be looking at something. Let, let's say Gerard Manley Hopkins, someone like that, you're mm. looking at something quite. Uh, familiar yeah. in a completely beauteous way, mm. hidden beauty of the world yeah. that you perhaps have taken for granted. Yeah. But the poetry is very much in less words, much more succinct mm. tonight. But um, we, we just really felt it was about looking, uh, understanding that people see things differently. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, so there's a different and, and that's down to a crafts person yeah. uh, that might be writing, uh, hopefully, uh, you know, with um, a, some level of authority too, because basically, um, back to the point before, was about how people interpret things. But history, the first drafts of history, if you like, are journalists and people who are authors. But yeah, in this day and age, we've got lots and lots of authors that perhaps haven't looked yeah. at things in a wider view. Mm. Mm. Yeah. 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 So that's really key, isn't it? That you know, making you making it as if it were not familiar. So yeah. taking a second look at something, yeah. seeing it anew yeah. and a fresh way. Yeah. 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 He also says in this essay um, that poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world, which I find <laughs> a really interesting. Claim that, yeah. that you know we talk, talked earlier about uselessness, but what he's saying is actually that they make they sort of make the, the laws by which we operate. We just mm. don't realise that they do it. Yeah. Which is kind of a, a really bold claim. It's something that I still don't know if I agree with, but yeah. it, it shows how how important he thought poetry yeah. was. And I think that's a, you know the about being this idea of art being useless, but also the uh, they're all extreme of it being yeah. the absolutely most useful thing. And I think that's uh, what it's, it, you, it makes say. you who you are. You know, it's mm. nothing. You're nothing if you don't have poetry. It's kind yeah. of it's kind of Shelley's idea, really. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. I mean, Shelley was also was also a very political poet. Yeah. So in, in talk about he's also talking about the political role of art, which he really struggled with and, and tried to uh, tried to do. Mm. 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 Mm.
in time, and that was said at a time when people had been driven out of the countryside into cities mm -hmm. and they become mm -hmm. divorced from nature mm -hmm. and uh, the romantic uh, movement yeah. to bring back um, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, uh, hidden beauty of nature mm -hmm. uh, to people from cities. Well, today we have a different situation. I mean, people are driven into cities even more so. Mm -hmm. but we have so many. Uh, means of communicating the hidden beauty of the world to people now that we didn't have in those days. Yeah. So aren't we in a different situation? Yeah. yeah, well our relationship to the natural world as well of course is a, yes. a big question, isn't it? With climate change and species extinction yeah. and so on. Yeah, because one, one of yeah. the... Yeah. Um, all the hidden beauty today uh, yeah. any more than some of the fantastic programs you see on television. Yeah. But one of the new ways of people are using a lot in literary criticism is something called eco-criticism, where they are going back to people like the Romantics in particular and thinking about how we use poetry to actually realign the way we think about nature and mm -hmm. write about things like climate change and those mm -hmm. kinds of yeah. things. So I suppose it still ha might still have relevance in that sense. But maybe beauty is not the right word yes. if we're thinking about it as being you know, something dangerous now. The hidden danger of the world, the hidden um, mm. horrors of the world, maybe. Yeah, but also yeah. not to take it for granted. Yeah. I think that's mm. yes. yeah. with, you know, mm. obviously, the things are developing yeah. in our world now, not to take things for granted. But, uh, isn't it the case that poetry is or has become essentially looking at thinking about things differently? Yeah. And, it, and that is that quality that drives all human advancement. Well, I mean, thank you. I would agree with you because I love poetry, but I'm not sure that everybody would say that. <laughs> but no, I can see what you mean, that you need to be, you need to see things differently in order to move on in, in lots of ways, don't you? Scientifically as well as culturally. Yeah, maybe, maybe you're right. It's interesting. Um, the final one is, is a kind of slightly different one, which came from a student, actually. Oh, why is it not going to the next slide? Has it died? should be. There we go. I realised that there's a, oh I oh I corrected the English one. Okay. Um, this someone said they didn't know what a magic eye thing was. Um, this is when it was big when I was a child the in the eighties. <laughs> there's something that eventually comes out to you as a picture if you mm -hmm. look at it for long enough. But I think the reason I wanted to put it up was because it's um it's from a student, and I just thought that it was an interesting analogy. Um, each time I look at a piece of poetry, there's always this what on earth is this about moment. Then as we analyse it, it all comes together. It's like those magic eye posters. You look at the image and then suddenly you see the picture the longer you analyse it. Somebody said that the last sentence is not very well written, but it is in an email, so to be fair. I think I know what he's trying to say, um, this student. And he was just very excited about, about this moment. That I was saying, you know, people sometimes have these kind of uh, light bulb moments in class, and I think that's what he was trying to describe. Um, but I, I think the reason I chose this is this question about poetry having this sense of is there something to be got? Is there one answer? Does it all suddenly come together or is that only one way of looking at poetry? What, what did you all think about that? We all no. kind of agree that we don't really <laughs> <laughs> get on with poetry. Oh, it's such a shame. It's a Ma magic eye posters don't always work. Yes. Uh, so but isn't that good poetry and bad poetry, poetry yeah. rather than poetry in general? Oh, sorry. No, I was going to say, basically, we, we agreed with the first sentence, but we, we, we didn't think that if you analyse it, it necessarily comes together. I think we were thinking a little bit about modern poetry as opposed mm. to older poetry, which makes it more difficult if you don't understand the emotion or in, in, feel the same emotion, and if you don't know who the author was at what time, if you get a piece of poetry out of context, it's more difficult. Uh. Yeah, we were basically um, <laughs> arguing that knowing, uh, for example, in this Shakespeare, for example, knowing what it means in Shakespearean term would help us, uh, help us understand and interpret the poem better. Mm -hmm. But right now, without the background, without the occasion, it can be like. Yeah. <laughs> but why is it about good or bad interpretation? Do you not think a poem can be anything and um, be about anything? It's more like. Um, does anyone know about a good Shakespeare thing which basically would make sense to people in Shakespearean time but not in today's but time? But it doesn't really, I know exactly what you mean, mm -hmm. but I think 
for me, good poetry is something that's eternal and therefore is tapping into something that's inside us already. So it shouldn't really matter when we're reading it or how we're reading it. But then I went to Cambridge. There was a very, we well, there was a very famous yeah. experiment. Yeah. 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 And it can, it can't just unkey something. Yeah. Mm. yeah. But, but I'm not think sure how much something got lost in the novel. You really don't understand. If you really come to yeah. it, you get lost in that obscurity. But why is a novel less obscure than a poem? I think it is. Just <laughs> <laughs> it? It's not? So, so <laughs> novels are the same? <laughs> because the veil that Oscar Wilde's talking about drawing off, yeah. at the same time as throwing another veil over. Mm. Because in poetry you often obfuscate things, you often make things look different to how they are, because you're looking at them in a different way or whatever. You're not doing that in prose? Whereas, isn't it? Um, I think in prose um, it's more direct. I mean, you're not, it, it, you, you describe a time and place, um, you might you make it as evocative as, as you can, but you don't, you don't, if you see it, you might throw in some metaphor. Mm. But the whole the whole piece is not metaphoric. Is probably not mm. generally, generally not. I'm generalising now. Um, but yeah, there's. I mean, there's, there's something there about the going back to the Shelley, isn't there? The defamiliarisation. Yeah. That the thing that poetry defamiliarises most of all is language yeah. that, that we use every day, and that our sort of everyday use of language. That poetry defamiliarises that. So it, it is. It is going to be difficult to because it's making you see language in a different way and use language in a different way. So that's kind of. It's part of what it's doing. It's one way. It just makes me about. sad because I think poetry is. Well, maybe it's, it's one of the reasons to study it. Is actually, good. that's what we were saying. And yeah. then, this is. I mean, this obviously mm. it's what I think, but this is what I think teaching can help. But I also think that teaching poetry is really about unlearning practices of. Mm. Yeah. of worrying that you've got it wrong, that you've misunderstood it, that there's an answer, because I think there often isn't, yeah. actually, and there are many answers, and it's yeah. just having the confidence to believe that in yourself, that you, you have the ability to read it yourself and mm. to understand it. Do you think yeah. you know? and, uh, I don't know, if you read a, some poems are very, seem very musical, very lyrical, yeah. or those, right, well, there's something, you talk about your Manny Hopkins, mm. there's something which... It's a good example, yeah. You might love, just because of the form, and or that's the fine. Or yeah, no, that, but that's but fine. I was just saying there are some poems mm. that don't have any of those things. Oh, and I hope obscure. that's not the truth. I hope that's well, not the truth. That, that but maybe me, they're but just bad poems. Well, that, yeah. that was what that's someone said. All poems are good yeah, poems, yeah, but they're yeah. still <laughs> poems. And I think so that's, that's another problem: is that people think if poetry is hard, it must be good hard, but rather than maybe just not very good. Yes, yeah, so maybe the poems are obscure and don't have the magic spyglass. And there is a nervousness around saying that in literature that things that might actually just not be very good. If you look at the record of Deutsch, yeah. if you don't understand Catholic theology and Jesuitical training, there are large patches mm -hmm. of that poem which are just totally unintelligible. Yeah. But you could still get something from that poem anyway. But yeah, there was a bit of Well, no, I mean, in terms of the language, the imagery, the mood, yeah. Yeah. the emotion. I think it is a mistake to think that you've yeah. got to know everything about the context, you've got to know everything about the author yeah. in order to engage with the poem. And then, because then you're not engaging with the poem. You're just learning all the context, all the context around it, and that text, that is a problem with the way that's taught at, at all level, yeah. I think, for GCSE. That you know, you're basically told, okay, go away, because you've learned the context, so therefore you know the poem. That, that's completely the wrong way. To, I think we also think thought that. that it was sometimes better if the poetry was read aloud. Yeah, mm. Mm. that has really yeah. got lost yeah. definitely. Yeah. That's yeah. not done as much now, which yeah. is a shame. You know, we're overrunning yeah, again. Got to stuck over <laughs> Thank you everybody for your uh, participation and comments. Yeah. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. Yeah, do please. Thank you very much. <laughs> do please look at what we have on offer. There's lots, lots of courses that you can do I actually, online. Courses I actually as well. run public engagement courses on on getting into poetry if you're nervous about it. So do give me your email if you're interested in coming to a course because um, it's one of my big passions. <laughs> <laughs>